Um, thank you indeed, Liviana, and also my, my thanks to the, uh, the Dalalana School of Public Health and to the CIHR, HIV Prevention Social Research Center, for inviting me here today, and thank you all for being here today. Any talk, any presentation is essentially a social product. It is not the product of one individual, it is the product of many, and their interactions, discussions, arguments, debates with one another. And here are just a few of the many people who in the last year or so have influenced the way in which I think about HIV. I owe a deep acknowledgement to each and every one of them because without them, my thinking would not be as it is. And just by way of gentle introduction, a little bit about myself. I originally studied medicine at university, but moved swiftly on to psychology, sociology, education, social care, and a whole range of other avenues of engagement with the issues that concern us all. And um, if you detect elements of that somewhat complicated history in what I have to say today, I make no apology for it. I think sometimes our understanding of uh, human nature and, and human society is the richer for our engagement in diverse perspectives. I wanted to begin today with um, reflecting, I guess, to a couple, what a couple of uh, colleagues and friends of mine said way back in the early 1990s. At that time, Kevin O'Reilly, who was working alongside myself in the World Health Organization's global program on AIDS, and Dusama Tawil, who now works in uh, North Africa, wrote a paper entitled, Enabling Approaches to HIV AIDS Promotion, Can We Modify the Environment and minimize the risk. And in this paper, they talked about the importance of two things in our prevention work, persuasion and enablement. The two are necessary. And the idea was a simple one. And of course, there it is, in very, very simple words, making healthy choices the easier choices. It has its origins, of course, here in Canada, and indeed in the work of the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion adopted by the International Conference on Health Promotion in November 1986. And although this did not address H HIV explicitly, and that uh, I always struck me as a little bit of a paradox, that at the time the epidemic was growing so rapidly, many working in the mainstream field of health promotion had relatively little engagement with it in those early days. Nevertheless, I think the Ottawa Charter establishes some principles for success, which it behoves us really to revisit here in the year 2009. The importance of a supportive environment and the fact that people cannot achieve their fullest potential unless they're able to take control over those things that determine their health. And around the same time as um, Kevin and Usama were writing, Michael Sweat and uh, Julie Dennison published in 1995 another paper in the journal AIDS. And their paper was entitled Reducing HIV Incidents in Developing Countries with Structural and Environmental Interventions. And in it, they called for a closer focus on what they saw as the key drivers of the epidemic. And here they are. Superstructural drivers, Factors at a national level, including issues of economic development. Structural factors affecting specific parts of the population, such as laws and policies. <coughs> Environmental factors, such as housing, living conditions. And individual level factors, including, these were the two they chose then, boredom and loneliness. I think we can think of some other individual factors as well as those. Shaping how the environment is experienced. And a few years later, in the year 2000, the same journal, AIDS, dedicated an entire issue to structural factors which were now defined by Esther Sumatojo as the physical, social, cultural, organizational, community, economic, legal, or policy aspects of the environment that impede or facilitate efforts to avoid HIV infection. And thereafter, until relatively recently, the history of structural factors in HIV prevention became a little more checkered. On the positive side, I guess, 
throughout the 1990s and into the early 2000s, there was a growing recognition that initiatives such as the, actually the inappropriately named 100% condom use campaigns in Thailand were effective in facilitating condom use among sex workers and their clients. There was evidence too that community focused collaborations between sex worker organizations and healthcare workers, such as the most famous of which I guess would be the Sonagachi project in Calcutta in India, could also be effective in reducing HIV related vulnerability among similar populations, in this case sex workers. But much more negatively, Perhaps the bulk of HIV prevention, particularly in the USA, and I think to some extent here in Canada, continued to focus on the individual, on their knowledge, on their skills, on their attitudes, and what is best termed perhaps individual risk. And over the last five years though, I guess some of the limitations of this rather partial approach have become clearer. And we've seen continuing rises in HIV infection throughout much of the global south, as well as in some countries of the north. And new epidemics of HIV beginning to emerge among groups such as gay and other homosexually active men, and in some countries among injecting drug users. And increasingly, countries have begun to experience more complex epidemics than was the case before within their own boundaries sometimes facilitated by migration, by mobility, but also, I believe, by continued inattention to the fundamental structural drivers of the epidemic. Poverty, gender inequality, racism, and homophobia, to name just a few of them. Here in Canada, for example, significant HIV epidemics have been identified in Aboriginal and Native American communities, in African and Caribbean communities, and among other groups who are systematically excluded from the mainstream. And increasingly, I think not just here in Canada, not just in my own country, but all over the world, it has become clear that what the late Jonathan Mann argued was the case in the very earliest days of the epidemic is coming true. And Jonathan Mann said that HIV and AIDS do indeed play into the fault lines of an already unequal world. I want to turn now to, I guess, a, an increasingly contemporary concern before coming back to these issues of structure later on. I want to talk about some of the consequences of treatment success. The discovery of effective treatment for HIV brought with it both a light and a darker side. From a positive perspective, these treatments brought hope to countless thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people all over the world. And for that, they must be recognized. But more negatively, an increased focus on treatment has resulted in a certain downplaying of HIV prevention whether it's at the level of individuals or the communities of which they're a part. Certainly a downplaying in much policy discourse at state, national and international levels. And increasingly, I think, in countries such as Canada or in my country, the UK, people tend to think that HIV has gone away or is simply a problem for countries in Africa. Rarely in my own country, does HIV ever hit the news now? We have no public information campaigns. Gay bars and saunas are not the settings for health promotion and activities. And young people, in particular, grow up in a culture which is very, very different from that which was there some 15 or 20 years ago. Of course, in one sense, this isn't surprising. The world changes. People's beliefs and expectations shift, and sexual practices, like all social practices, adapt and change. And those of us who work in HIV and AIDS should always guard against what I sometimes think of as a kind of professional nostalgia for the times when there was a sense of urgency and people took notice of HIV, 
But when things become really bad, and people start to misread their own epidemics, then we really do need to pay attention. I want to turn now to what I'm beginning to call the professional misreading of success. And let me give you an example of this. In the UK recently, our Health Protection Agency recently reported that HIV diagnoses among gay men have continued to rise for the third successive year. This is a, a quote from one of their websites recently. They talk about the fact that the last year for which reliable data is available, new diagnoses reached their second highest level since recording began, with a substantial increase in diagnoses among gay men. A few months earlier, the head of HIV surveillance at the Health Protection Agency said this, pointing to the fact that heterosexual transmission of HIV is rapidly increasing in the UK as well. And another report from that same agency indicates that among young people rates of infection are rising. Although it has to be said that young people are not especially at risk of HIV in the UK, look at the numbers, compared with members of other groups and communities. Which is an interesting point which if I had more time I could return to the ways in which young people have been demonized within this epidemic in contexts where their vulnerability may not necessarily be greatest. But nevertheless, what about injecting drug users in the UK? The annual number of new di uh, diagnoses among injecting drug users fell between 1992 and 2000, but has gradually risen over the past five years. This is all quite shocking, particularly given that the UK was once at the forefront of global efforts to manage the epidemic among those who inject through education, through stringent needle exchanges, through condom distribution and through other harm reduction measures. And it's particularly shocking given that the UK continues to promote itself internationally as a font of expertise in HIV prevention. So what then is our official government position on those statistics I've just shown you? Well, here it is from the Department of Health's website. Some would call this complacency. Others might call it a willful desire not to engage with material realities. Low prevalence the, HI, sorry, low prevalence the UK might have had but it also has some of the most rapidly rising rates of HIV infection anywhere in Europe. And was it really public education and health promotion that brought about the gains which we made in the epidemic in those early years? I very much doubt it, having been around at the time. And indeed, would that health education and health promotion were as easy as seems implied by that fairly glib statement. I'm sure the government of Canada doesn't say equivalent things. 